And welcome back to part two of our show today. That's dealing with sexuality and more specifically the darker aspects of it. And I'm joined by sexologist and uh, doctor in spear, Stephanie Likes. Hi. Is that how you pronounce your name, by the way? Yes, that's perfect. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry that, that we had to just cut it off at the end of part one. We could probably go on forever on that, but we have to move <laughs> on. We, we have an agenda here. Absolutely. So, right. So the next on my list is, I guess we could call it age play, mm -hmm. although I do know there's uh, subcategories there too. Like uh, one thing I know for sure, and that's that I, I've never find anyone who admits to, to enjoying it, but uh, that's uh, when a uh, grown as man mm -hmm. is putting on like baby uh, uh, clothes and mm -hmm. uh, the woman is changing diapers. I think that's one of the most <laughs> no turnoffs of women I've talked with. <laughs> Uh, but it, it would, that would be considered age play, right? Yeah, um, that actually has a, a name in and of itself. Um, okay. It's called paraphilic infantilism. Ah, so, base, yeah, right. so it's uh, the uh, reverting back to being an infant, and then um, it's like an inverted pedophilia, isn't it? Um, I mm, without victim. I, 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 I just. I'd rather just I just leave it in the domain of age play simply because with uh, with pedophilia, if it's actually acted out, it's the question of you know the consent and yeah. um, the agency that the younger person has, and so their ability to actually decide to engage in play is questionable. Mm. Um, with uh, with infantilism, it's uh, for me it kind of takes on more of that um, nurturing. Uh, desire, mm. the desire to be cared for completely. So whether it's, you know, you're being bottle fed or, you know, you, you're wearing a diaper that someone then has to change, you know, there might be a playpen involved and yeah. playing with baby toys and baby talk. It's, it's, mm. um, it's not one that I've actually explored extensively, but from what I understand for some people, it is that, that, that nate that nurturing desire um from the older person the, the the desire to be taken care of so no but does the other person have to actually be older uh well somebody the way that i've usually seen it played out um is that there is one person who's more so in the caregiver or older role for and then there's yeah the role the role is older right. but, but right but, the role is older oh no not physically right no, right no Absolutely not. Because I think uh, in BDSM too, I think we see age play. Like, uh, mm -hmm. I know a very common thing is like mommy, daddy. Mm -hmm. Or. And baby girl. What, what do you call it if it's a male? Uh, uh, it's, it's DDLG. It's a daddy, dom, little girl fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. So, and for. I can't remember. And the, and the reverse, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, there's. Um, uh, there's the mommy version of that. So yeah, age play is, a, is, 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 pr it's pretty huge within the BDSM community. Um, you know, there are for men who kind of adopt the, the identity of daddy, the idea of, um, taking care of say they're, they're little, but isn't there an actual age gap in those cases too? Uh, yeah, usually there's a very large age gap between mm. it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. You, I don't often see, um, well, so I, I actually, I've uh, spoken with a couple of women who they are older, but they do kind of adopt the identity of a little girl. So they'll mm. um, say part of the play is coloring in color books or having daddy bring them a new toy um, or a new stuffed doll, really adopting that identity of a little girl, even though they're much older themselves. And their their partners that they've had actually have been men um, around their age, if not younger. So, <laughs> but it's not, the thing is though, like if you go on say certain platforms like Tumblr, for instance, yeah. you're never going to see that um, be identified in that way. The, the woman being the older, you mean? 
Yeah. It's mm. always like just barely legal or just uh, on the other side of, of legal consenting age. And uh, usually an older gentleman, usually around, say, like 30, mid 30s and up. Right. That's usually yeah, how. But, but cool cougars are accepted now, I think, isn't it? Uh, yeah. 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 Mm. Cougars. Yeah. Yeah. There's and that's age play too. Yeah, it is. It is. But I think um, when you think of it uh, with regards to cougars, cougars is, I don't see it so much in the realm of BDSM or uh, fetish play, but more so just in actual real life. Um, okay, so that's not age play. Yeah, it's older women just deciding to take, you know, a younger male as their companion or sexual lover. But it's not It's not defined as age play? No, oh, no, okay. I, w- I wouldn't define it as age oh, play. Okay, okay. <laughs> so if it's g- going to be age play, it has to, the age thing has to be the focus. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, and as uh, some kind of role? Yeah, yeah. It's not so much that we just happen to have a, a large age gap between us. It for for many the the DDLG play involves say this adoption of a younger identity, a younger um, way of of playing and acting. That's mm. that's how that whole concept of like you know I've been bad, so daddy's going to have to spank me. Mm. Teaching your your little you know the difference between right and wrong and punishing her when she does something bad or rewarding her with gifts when she does something good and usually there like i said there's the um, the play extends to what your your little actually does so mm. uh the like i said like coloring and things that that normally little girls will will do for their leisure so but what about, what about this very modern and in my eyes, despicable uh, phenomenon where, uh, you know, the sugar daddy thing. Mm-hmm. You you won't find sugar mommy. Uh, and now I'm talking about actually young girls, students maybe, mm-hmm. who prey upon morons who pay them without <laughs> even getting sex in return. But, you know, it's just that exploiting of... Well, I'm just imagining uh, someone who can't... Maybe I'm just biased. Maybe it's not mm-hmm. an ugly male who can't get women. Maybe it's mm-hmm. maybe they do have the money to do it. I don't know what motivates yeah, them. But, but I, is, isn't it, that some kind of age play too? Well, you know, it's... It's not so much age play simply because, again, there's the, there's a usually an acting component that goes along with age play. Right. Like whatever age you... Or, or um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Whatever a phase in life that you're acting out, you act accordingly to that phase. So engaging in, say, yeah, say, the best word is play. I guess yeah, yeah, it has to be game. Yeah, mm. where those sites that you talk about, like um, like sh- uh, sugar babies, uh, and well, not so much actually Madison. That's more so for um, extramarital affairs. But you know, it's not. I don't. It's not so much young girls preying on men any more so than it's men i don't want to say taking advantage of because they're both both parties are actively aware of that yeah but i'm not i'm not talking about that they have sex um i've read about no, 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 i get that yeah. i get that but both parties are actively aware of what what the the negotiation is right and mm-hmm. for guy for men who do either adopt the daddy identity, whether it is in BDSM or even men who do want to have, say, a sugar baby that they take care of, the whole idea for them is this having the means and the desire to take care of someone else. Interesting. There are men who actually for them and and they they understand that sex may never be on the table. But for them, it I for me I feel like it kind of harkens back to this idea of men being the provider right they go mm. out they make the money they catch the they catch the deer or whatever and they come back and they provide for their the people under them and you know in some cultures the more money that you have and the the better ability you have to provide for say women that enhances your um the opportunity for you to even take on, say, additional partners or additional wives, right? Mm. So it's all, it's kind of like seen as a mark of virility as well. So again, back to culture and, um, mm-hmm. and uh, those kind of mechanisms to explain it. Well, maybe, but I'm thinking, honestly, if you want to 
play on if you want to manipulate a man go through his crotch right if you want to manipulate <laughs> a woman go through her heart that's probably why you won't find the reverse phenomenon women are too clever you can't you know a man if he really wants a girl uh, and some of us unfortunately will go through fire and water if we're horny enough mm -hmm. but a woman I, I i don't see a, a young guy manipulating a woman like that oh, for money you, you have to come to the u.s okay so you yeah. have <laughs> lots of gigolos okay yeah they're definitely sugar mamas here okay look at me i'm yeah. biased uh, and out of touch yeah, but th these are my biases okay yeah. i'm completely no, no, exposed no. <laughs> yeah i mean you know you're it's, it's all relative to what you what you're exposed to right yeah, yeah. yeah so um there are definitely there's a growing number of of um, sugar mamas who are willing to keep young men simply for, this, for okay. the sake of seeing that they can keep someone. Okay. Um, it's not something that I personally am into because I like my money. Uh, <laughs> same so. here, by all means, same here. <laughs> yeah, but no. Hello? Sure for that. Here. Hello? Oh, can you, can you hear me? Yeah, something happened. You disappeared. Oh, so sorry. Yeah, no, I was just saying there's definitely a growing culture for it. Okay. So. Yeah. But what about the online phenomenon where you can't even excuse it with taking care of? You have girls, probably poor girls who need to make uh, a quick book. They set up these camps mm -hmm. what? and then they get sugar daddies mm -hmm. or not even camps. I, I read about how they they don't physically interact, mm -hmm. but they have like some kind of, I guess it's digital. What uh, is the option, right? phone mm -hmm. sex i don't think so and so uh they pay them and i don't know what they get back actually it's it's just very weird in my eyes but then you can't explain it with nurturing or anything um they let's say they send them uh, uh, their undies is that what you called mm -hmm. yeah and <laughs> panties the panties yeah, underwear. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so uh, in return for money i don't know but it's it's definitely a part of paraphilia but age play that's very fraudulent isn't it um i would think so yeah i think so yeah yeah it's um but there's no victims there um uh how so no, I'm saying there's no victims, right? Well, uh, no. I mean, if I think if you're if you both come to the table and negotiate how the the play or the practice will take place, then no, I don't think I don't think there's any victims. But because many people condemn huge age gaps, especially yes. uh, I guess maybe especially if the woman is the older but mm -hmm. it's really one of those phenomenons because i can see how people can feel negative towards something that's actually negatively impacted like if you act upon um, pedophilia mm -hmm. or if you take let's say blood and stuff like that uh, too mm -hmm. far uh, or, or, or excrements but mm -hmm. But that's not usually what what people condemn are usually psychologically, as we're going to see later, psychologically motivated. So I guess when they condemn an age play, and, and I know women who really condemn, let's say, a 50-year-old man who's mm -hmm. with a 20-year-old woman, both are mm -hmm. grown up, right? And both are mutually consenting. There's no victim there, but many women will condemn that a lot. Well, that's that's because that's more of uh, this. Um, I think it more so lies with our our obsession, our celebration with um, youth, at least especially when it comes to women. Um, it's it can be sometimes seen as men who have been with say one partner for a while and they get to say a certain station or status in life yeah. and they quote unquote trade in mm -hmm. for a newer model, if you will, when it comes to women. And the problem that goes along with that is we as a society, we, the older men get the, they become quote unquote more refined. We, they're revered. The grays that, 
that show um, in their hair their marks of wisdom and you know men get better with age while women it's yeah. like once you pass the age of say 30 35 you know automatically no, I, I'd say 40 today it's yeah, 40, yeah 40 everything just starts your value your worth in society diminishes from physical perspective and so then it's so like the sisters get jealous that's what you're saying that's why they condemn it <laughs> I don't. I don't even think it's. I, no, I won't. I won't even say it's, it's jealousy. It's just this idea that suddenly I am unworthy after a certain age. While you get to, I guess, to your birth. Yeah, but sexually, it's different. A, a woman peaks what thirty, no. and a man no. peaks no. No. when a it's. Peaks. No, I'm talking. I talk about uh, libido here. Yeah, no, women peak around the age of forty. Forty. Men peak around the age of say eighteen to twenty-one. Exactly. So, yeah. so in libido, it's reversed. Isn't that yeah. weird, huh? Yeah, it's very much reversed. But it's it all depends on who's controlling the narrative. You know, so if you live in a in a male dominated society, it doesn't matter that my biologically I am at my sexual peak later mm. years in life. You have to you write the you write the narrative. You you set the the story that's being told. And in this case, it's you know I'm going to go and get a new nubile younger woman. Mm. You know, and it's it's crazy because like I think when. You know, when you asked that question earlier about um, there's no uh, abuse or it's everyone's consenting in this dynamic, I think part of the concern that is also tied around that when it comes to young women and older men is this idea of being of, of this younger woman almost being um, seen as an extension of uh his social standing like it's not mm. so much that you have come together because you are of like mind and you have so much in common and you have the same goals and like i think that can happen i mean no no no. i'm not saying it can't happen yeah. but i also remember what i was like when i was 20 and <laughs> but love isn't necessarily connected to intellect not, i love my cat but, I, but, but she can't the, match my intellect you're right i still can feel emotions to her right but i think but i think then the question becomes so why i think for women in that situation because i i find myself asking it what exactly do you have in common with someone that is 20 30 years younger than you because for me if it, it happens every so often, so for some age really isn't a number or, or age really is just a number. Yeah. It doesn't matter the age. If you guys connect and you connect, but when you no longer are seeking out people who should, okay. by all accounts and purposes, mm. share the same life experiences and bring the same things to the table, yeah. then it becomes predatory because it's not. Then it's a fetish. Yeah. Yeah, it's not about finding 20-year-olds that suddenly now you connect with. It's about finding a younger woman, <laughs> you know? So. Yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. Yeah. But, but, you know, just like I don't have anything in common with lots of people at my age, there has to be some older and younger than me that I do have something mm -hmm. in common with. But, right. um, no, I, I get what you're saying. Again, you, you, you tend to explain, I, I guess that's your uh, New York education, but you, you tend to explain <laughs> yeah. everything by nurture and, and nothing by <laughs> nature. Uh, well, I think it's just because like, cause I, I come from two very... Um, so my, my background is both in science and research as well as um, social sciences. So I have a very... Yeah, I can, I, the social sciences, that comes through, yeah. I, I'll tell you. Yeah. Because in my yeah. view, it's... Um, and I'm not saying I'm right, you're wrong. I'm just... Uh, it's interesting. I, I want to keep both perspectives on the table, but I think mm -hmm. it's it boils down to one simple thing. Men are more attracted to looks, mm -hmm. again, because of biological components, whereas women, I'm not saying women don't care about looks, but you have more attraction triggers than we do. And that's why a 20-year-old can be attracted to a 50-year-old, even though he doesn't look, you know, he's not a pretty boy anymore. Mm -hmm. But a 50-year-old woman, if she doesn't keep in shape, I mean, she has to work more. Uh, than a 50 year old in terms of keeping in shape in order to be attractive you see what i mean there are some in my view biological components here there there are but i think also it's i think so the conversations that i've had with um 
the women that I know. Mm -hmm. um, we've had these uh, discussions around, uh, I hate to say it's settling, but this idea that you're almost expected to look beyond looks when it comes to men, right? Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of times it's like, oh, well, you know, uh, you know, he, he may be a good provider in the future or he, you know, is kind or caring. He has a this. great personality. Yeah, a great personality and all this. And I, for one, speaking not only for myself, but also, like I said, the, the discussions I've had, mm -hmm. I think it's complete BS because <laughs> when I see someone across the room, I'm not saying, wow, he has really bulging personality. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, but it's his, his uh, radiance, right? You, yeah, I mean, I think... But attraction it, isn't a choice. It's subconscious. It's, it's not. But I, and so that, that, for me, is like the same way that a woman or a man may be attracted to like the the a younger woman because of the the body and the skin and you know the lack of sagging and things like that yeah. it doesn't change for women you know what i mean like you we're the same things that we were attracted to in, in in our youth such as like a man who is fit and young and so hang on so if a man's scrotum hangs low that's actually a negative thing for a woman? Uh, low hanging? I, I didn't know she cared. Well, <laughs> I, I can tell you if the boobs is hanging okay. low, that's actually <laughs> okay. a thing for many men. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. I think there's differences here. I think, but I think for me, I'm, I'm just taking it more so from the level of, you know, attraction is attraction. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, what you like doesn't necessarily shift just because of um, not just age, but also just because of, the sex that you inhabit. I think that I'll probably be 40 years old and still looking to for the younger aesthetic on a man because that's you know, he's younger, he's in shape, he's he looks great versus say a man shape I get. I mean everybody wants yeah, healthy yeah. and shape. You know, you want healthy. But I notice that uh the older I get, the less uh I look at young girls sexually N now i feel like if a girl is at least under 20 i tend to look at her more as a kid yes that, that that's a yes. weird uh, it's normal. I, I guess I it's, it's natural it's, natural. it's maturing right yeah but yeah. so i don't believe we keep the you know what i liked when i was 16 is <laughs> not the same i like today oh, no so my, my point is like like if you're comparing it say for like men and women because for instance a man men like younger looking women oh, like a woman women. Who's say, like when we're looking at the dynamic of like a 50 year old with a 20 year old man right because or like you see that more ha happening more often in society the older men going with younger women my point is is that like when you're looking at it from just the level of attraction mm -hmm. it's the same thing for women however okay. you by that time should have had enough relationship experience to know that looks aren't everything you also know what may come with that with the youth like yeah. you said like if you look at a woman who say under the age of 20 you look at her as a kid and you know that it's individually of course but uh, yeah you know that like there's a good chance she hasn't had much life experience you know she probably has doesn't have much to bring to the table with regards to not only um you know socioeconomic means but also just with regards to like uh, just life experience. Yeah. There's, it's going to be limited because they're such a child. Yeah, but I don't, I don't think about that. You're rationalizing it. For me, I'm not mm -hmm. pondering it. It's just immediately th there's a child. Mm -hmm. But, but I, I don't think it's true. I mean, some people are attracted to, to you know, young people, e e mm -hmm. like age play or pedophilia. But I, I don't think uh, for men, it's not that we are attracted to young girls. What we are attracted to is beauty. Okay, and it's just a sad fact of life that uh, the young people have beauty on their side more than the old people and that you have to work for preserving. When I say beauty now, I know it sounds superficial. I mean, there's 80 year old people who are beautiful, but you know what I mean? It's this healthy, I understand. it's not sagging everything, right? So I don't think it's the age. I think it's just the looks and so then, younger people tend to have the, keep the looks. You know what I mean? So then what, what would you say then? Um, you say that men are attracted to beauty. So what yeah, would women looks. be attracted to? Uh, I think it's five uh, attraction triggers. One is beauty. Another is power. Mm -hmm. 
A third is personality. Uh, let's see, what's the two others? Uh, I wasn't prepared here. Um, <laughs> no, no, but I think there's basically five attraction triggers, and and fame is one of them. Fame. Uh-huh. But the thing is, men can't do anything about. You know, if you're ugly, yeah, you can you can probably improve a little, but it's biologically uh, given. If you're not rich. You can probably try to get more wealthy, but it's not as easy. At the end of the day, we have one thing we can compensate with, and that's personality. And this is true, Steph, because it's given rise to a huge field called, uh, uh, what's it called again? Pickup artist. Um, mm-hmm. I forgot the common word, but mm-hmm. it's been there since the end of the 90s, and it's working. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's two, basically two poles is there. Is you talking about the, like, where it's like you practice, like, Neg- the game negging and stuff like yeah i read that book all that stuff yeah well yeah. that's a bad book <laughs> david angelo is a better uh, one there or even david data if you want a more spiritual touch but here's the thing even if you use the robotic thing of the i forgot what they're called but there's less like two schools one studies women and uses it surgically so they become like robots, these guys, uh, and it works. So they just uh, use the triggers. The other school is much better because it's a kind of a self-development program. Mm-hmm. And there they improve themselves. Mm-hmm. They become the best masculine versions of themselves. Mm-hmm. And both poles work. But my point is women can, to a certain extent, do the same. But if they look, let's just say, ugly. They don't have as much of a chance, whereas an ugly man actually can compensate um, for his bad looks. And I don't, I think it says more about you than us, because, uh, I mean, kudos to you for not being so superficial that you, that uh, you actually can be with. You should embrace it. Uh, Even feminists (laughs) should accept this. But I think it's a biologically funded difference. But you know what? We've uh, strayed off the path. I'm sorry. I have to. (laughs) You missed it. This is a conversation we will have to revisit as well because now I'm fascinated. I know. I've, I've never really seen the whole um, PUA um, approach actually happen in public, like in real life, and actually seen it work. So really, I yeah. Oh my god! I promise you it works. I, just... I promise you. <laughs> Look, I've been a coach, uh, working as a coach, not a PUA coach, uh-huh. but I have uh, I've, I've teach meditation, a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. I can tell we can take this privately or we can have a, uh, you can come back and we can discuss it another Absolutely. time okay because it's yes, very interesting okay but uh, uh, yes there's a lot of lo- look the reason people don't believe it works is that the worst guys are the ones who obviously pays mm-hmm. to become better and some of them are doomed to fail right mm-hmm. and and some of them do improve to a certain extent and some become masters mm-hmm. um and the reason it has a bad rap is because of all the losers and when they come out in the field <laughs> sorry to call them losers but you know what i mean right and when they go, come out in the field they kind of blow it right there's a lot mm-hmm. of trial and error so then people think oh it doesn't work mm-hmm. well they don't see the entire there's even shows you can see if you want to study this up close i think there's two different television shows that has demonstrated mm-hmm. this Okay. Uh, what is it called? I, I can give you the name of the yeah, shows in private. Yeah, definitely. Please. And, and there they, they take the 10 worst people. You, you know, these reality shows where you know, the beauty and the beast or whatever it's called, stuff like that. So they take yeah. the 10 worst guys you can imagine. There's no hope for them. And then you follow their progression and one and one is voted out by the PUA experts, right? Mm-hmm. And at the end, there's one king who becomes you know, the new PUA master. That's one concept. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting to see this because they have hidden cameras. It's out in for real in the streets in cafes, whatever. So it's a whole culture. It's it's so cool. Anyway, (laughs) enough about that. Let's move on. We have so much interesting stuff to discuss here. Mm -hmm. I guess role playing. Mm -hmm. Could that be like, say, uh, we pretend, let's say we're a couple and uh, you pretend to be like, uh, what's it called when you're a robot, but you look like a human being? What's the word for that? Oh, the uh, the AI, like the sex doll. 
Is that the one that you Yeah, kind of like in these, uh -huh. you know, West world times, whatever. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so that can be a role play or you can play that, um, I don't, anything can be a role play, yeah. but would role play itself be defined as paraphilia? Uh, I think so. I think it depends on, um, like there's role play in general, just the idea of adopting uh, an identity other than your own, mm -hmm. which can be a paraphilia, but you know, role play can go so much further um, like for instance, there's, um, like animal role play or primal play where you, um, right. act out as, uh, you know, um, as animals, uh, there's, uh, uh, to a certain, um, extent there's, uh, like people who are plushies. It's sometimes it doesn't necessarily involve role play, but plushies like where you kind of, where you dress up and, uh, adopt a, um, uh, like a uh, like a plush toy, like a stuffed animal type deal. Oh right, is that what's called cosplay? Yeah, um, furries, plushophilia. Um, okay. Here's that. So that's not what they call cosplay. Uh, oh, cosplay. Yeah, it can. Yeah, um, that's a part of it. Because then um, it's you'll find that if you ever do like a Venn diagram of like sexualities, there's so many that cross over. Mm. So just how like cosplay is like, yeah, you know, you dress up in costumes, but then like there's a segment of it that's just strictly for like um, – people who dress up as ponies or pony play. Right, right, right. Um, there's people who say with animal play, like whether you just, uh, you adopt the identity of say like a cat or a dog or something even more primal, like your, your wolves or it's, there's role play has, has, uh, a number of, um, variations underneath it but basically any time where you are adopting the identity or embodying the 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 identity of something else other than yourself it definitely counts as role play mm. Mm -hmm. so yeah. yeah and it's a good point what you say that it crosses over because what yes. we are we are trying to you know we're trying to put into squares into into mm -hmm. I, these are organic things mm -hmm. where everything is just conflating and then we're trying to systemize it and categorize it so obviously there has to be crossovers mm -hmm. so so that's a good point uh, but this reminds me when you talk about people pretending to be animals or whatever mm -hmm. and i totally get it if it's like you're a wild beast, you know, like the the lion, mm -hmm. the lion out on the savanna, you know, mm -hmm. stalking the gazelle. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there is a, something very sexy about that. It's primal, right. as you say. But right. that reminds me of something that's pretty similar in my view, at least, to pedophilia, namely zoophilia, if that's the word, uh, zoophilia. Uh, where you get turned on. You actually engage in uh, sex with, with another... actual animals. Yeah, yeah actual animals. And, yes. and they would be victims, wouldn't they? They have no consent. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, that same course that I mentioned earlier where I was looking, uh, where I had to see, watch videos of um, uh, extreme play, my class, actually, we, we didn't have to watch it, but I do know that some uh, groups did have to watch films on bestiality um oh, that's what they call it okay yeah mm. be, yeah bestiality or the uh official term is uh zoophilia yeah. uh where you do engage in sex with animals um i that for me is it's a it's a bit of a hard line simply because um you know i'm i i'm an animal lover i have a, a dog <laughs> who is yeah. just like you know, a little person who kind of sheds all over my apartment. And um, <laughs> so, so, so if a zoophiliac came to your office, that's one of those few you, you would know, turn down. I just, uh, I, I don't want to say no. You know, I'd have to look at the extent to where their um, desire has expanded to like if it's like a something they're thinking about if there's something that they've engaged in um if it's like the only type of play that brings some pleasure i'm not really sure how much i'd be able to separate for that but what what on earth could cause such an urge such an desire well you know i think i'm not really sure so okay for some i think it might be just the uh, ability to dominate something lesser than themselves like you know how when they uh, 
if you talk about, say, bullying, right, mm -hmm. um, or abuse, usually it's you inflicting um, pain, anguish, abuse, some type of power or dominance over something that's less than yourself. And, you know, that's one of the markers that they'll look for when trying to determine, um, like, uh, if a person has, um, say, committed some type of act and they'll look in their past and see, like, were they uh, abusive to animals, for instance, because, again, it's something else that they actually have power over. I think with regards to zoophilia, I think it may be a combination of the feeling of exerting power. For some, it may be like this idea of um, access. Let's say if you're unable to maybe get a partner of your own and, mm. you know, but you... Right, right. You know the retarded I mean? redneck who, who takes it out on the sheep. <laughs> yeah, the classical. Well, or just, you know, like if you look looking at different cultures, especially like for... Um, uh, what is it like herding or whatever way like back in the day, right, you know, right. men who would herd sheep and there's not a woman around and it's just them. The sheep's not going to tell anyone. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You know, yeah, I don't I, know. Yeah. Again, you're big on the cultural component, but I, there's yeah. something biologically. I just, oh, I'm sure. in, in most people, I think there's a hard line to even yeah. for shepherds. Yeah. I but think, I think that shepherds will love their animal too, by the way. So uh, absolutely. I don't. Absolutely. And, and what about if you, if you Google it? I actually researched all these things before uh, you came on here today. And mm -hmm. I'll tell you, when I Googled it, I didn't find one example of a man having sex with an animal. But do you know what I found? Really? Really. That's interesting. I found a lot of girls, mm -hmm. like uh, horses and dogs especially, seem to be yeah. big. I couldn't watch yeah. it. It was disgusting. But there was like a yeah. thumbnail on the vids. Mm -hmm. So that so your suggestions there doesn't apply to that. Yeah. The, I mean, how, how can you think the girl feels power by being raped by a dog well, or a uh, horse? So some of those instances I have seen where um, there was uh, uh, a lack of uh, consent even for the woman who oh, wow. was in, has engaged. Um, I know there's been instances of that where there, there's, there's force or coercion used to right. force them to engage in that for the pleasure of someone else. Yeah, for, for the porn viewer. Yeah, for the, yeah, for the viewer or the person who's filming or, um, mm -hmm. you know, usually there's a... Um, it's a, it's a it's definitely a, a humiliation factor. Yeah, that, but I also that, read that, Yeah, but I read stories about girls who uses the cats or the dogs in masturbation. That's not a big uh, bad uh, man in the yeah. in the shadows. Yeah, so 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 it is a thing for girls too. And then we can't explain it with the bully thing, right? The say that again. Well, well, a girl who has uh -huh. a pet, a cat or a dog, uh -huh. and uses uh -huh. that pet in her own masturbation. Right. Yeah. Um. I. That's a thing. It's it is a thing, and for me, there's there's so many. You're right. I'm a social scientist at heart. I, there's so many factors. <laughs> I know. I know. There's so many factors that will go into that. And that's okay. That's why I'm the devil's advocate. Okay, just so but, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Or just um, uh, I, I assume like you're talking about like like with cats or dogs, like with oral, right? Using the dogs or the 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 pets to um uh, to to lick them. Yeah, to lick them. Yeah, it's uh. There's usually something underneath that, underlying that, um, and it can range from just having access to it or just being, um, let's say you, this is not something that you can ask for or get otherwise. And again, the animal is not, it's not, it's not going to be vocal. The animal's not going to say no. So to speak. It, it might not even understand it's sexual. Exactly. It's just, oh, oh, there's yeah, something. Yeah, they won't understand it's sexual. She probably put something down there so the dog will lick it, yeah. right? And oh, num, yummy, yummy, right? <laughs> it's funny. I've actually heard of young men who will take um, something like uh, like peanut butter, 
for instance, right. and they'll put it on their genitals, oh my. and then they'll have the family dog lick it off. They must be crazy. It, they it, risk it, Jesus. It's and it's, so it's like one of those. It's um, that's, that's even that's even worse than using the vacuum. I've heard some use that too. I just oh my! I just saw something the other day about a vacuum. Guys, stop using appliances yeah, like that. It's, it's just dangerous. It it will oh it's so dangerous. It's so dangerous. So, but but I think even if the animal doesn't understand it, I I, I cannot condemn it. I'm sorry to no, say, yeah. I, that's a hard limit for me too. I mean, I think I think it, I consider it to be animal abuse. Yeah. Personally, um, but uh, yeah, I would have to. Um, there's usually something else there, or no, or another factor or two that underlies the actual behavior of why it happens. Um, you know, and then, like, you know, when we're talking about, say, like uh, where it might originate, for instance, let's say if you grew up on uh, around animals and uh, animals mating is ah, what you're exposed to right. yeah you know what i mean yes. so yeah it can and then somehow that like may flip a switch yep. or trigger something yep, yep. and so um, Co- connected to something else I, I have to tell you a short story because mm-hmm. i have a friend she experimented a lot mm-hmm. with uh, and she's in the age where uh, I forgot what it's called but at the end of her fertility mm-hmm. she's transitioning menopause. Over to, yeah. menopause. Mm-hmm. so she wanted to explore some stuff so she tried being dominant What's mm-hmm. it, uh, dominat- dominatrix yeah mm-hmm. so she was with a lot of men Mm-hmm. And uh, she told me something very interesting and and that uh, a light bulb went on because we discussed like we do now, what's the causations to different paraphilias? And and we did agree that a few baselines are inherited, like some certain personality traits. We may be different character types. And then if that's stimulated, then by nurture, then we can become like this or that. But some things are mere psychological, mere trauma, whatever. She, one guy, mm-hmm. he wanted her to cut his hair. Mm-hmm. And she didn't get how he could be turned on and get off on that. Mm-hmm. And then uh, she digged a little deeper and yeah, it turned out that when he was in the age where you're starting to become sexual, mm-hmm. he, really, he, had, mm-hmm. yeah, he had a trouble with his father, very dominating father. And his father insisted that he cut his hair. So he, he dragged him off to the uh, to a hairdresser. Mm-hmm. And the hairdresser was this... Uh, in his eyes, beautiful woman who mm-hmm. represented everything sexual, mm-hmm. and and he was forced cut by his father, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she participated in that. Mm-hmm. And so for this boy, the feeling of a woman cutting his hair mm-hmm. become a big sexual fetish, mm-hmm. and it's so logical, right? When you hear this story, it just mm-hmm. clicks, and that's what I think is behind most of these fetishes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, as before you um, had mentioned the, the component about his, his father, you know, the just the act of hair cutting itself, it's a very intimate experience. Um, mm, there's a point. transform. Yeah, I, you know, and there's a transformation that can occur with the act of changing, you know, your outward appearance. But with regards to like the father... And, you know, the force attached to it. And that's transferred to the woman. No, she was... Because it wasn't just a woman cutting the hair. It was a dom. Yeah. And um, I find that for some people who do engage in, say, um, power exchange um, or power play, um, taking on a a dominant submissive approach to, to fetishism or play... Usually for some, it can lie in um, taking back your power in some shape, mm. form or fashion. It's about changing the, the, the narrative or the origin of how this particular act that may have happened to you in the past where you didn't have um, power over. Or maybe you did have power over the situation and you got such a rush from it. But then it's like when it, if you do decide to kind of uh, play it out, say in a DS relationship, and again, I just say that this may be for some people, um, put, it's kind of situating it in a controlled environment where you are controlling 
that this is going to happen. Mm. Even if you are in the submissive role, it's a way of kind of taking your agency back. So yeah, I'm not surprised that that kind of um, did something for him mm. that, uh, that he eroticized it later on in life. Yeah, so before we condemn uh, other people for whatever uh, prevalences they have, we mm -hmm. must bear in mind that they are just, uh, you know, there are some of their experience on earth. So, mm -hmm. and besides, if you condemn someone mm -hmm. for their desires, mm -hmm. usually that amplifies them. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and they are not personally responsible for them anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. you know what? I think if you're willing to come back, uh, we should do another show on, because I see there's no time for that, uh, on yeah. healing in sexuality. Yes, definitely. Could we discuss therapy and healing and how to, yes. yeah? Because we yeah. have a huge, we have one more huge topic to go through today and mm -hmm. that will take the rest of the show today. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and I wanted to discuss how people can, you know, I wanted to discuss trauma and healing. Mm -hmm. So let's do that in a separate show. Then there's room for more philosophizing around us. Absolutely. I would love to come back. Absolutely. By the way, I want to say also that the reason I, I want us to uh, make a follow-up, uh, another show, is because I imagine in my naivety that we would have time to go through Because what you told, you said it can be liberating, mm -hmm. but some people uh, become obsessed with the BDSM thing and they push mm -hmm. and they push and they push borders. Yes. And, yes. and that's a huge topic. And we, uh, today I'm noticed that we tend to drift into causation discussions, which are very mm -hmm. interesting. And that's mm -hmm. perfect if we, if you come back and we have a show about trauma and healing and sex. Yes. Right. Absolutely. And then all those questions are belong there. Yeah. But let's move on, uh, Steph, mm -hmm. and let's attack now, I guess, the last big one. Oh, no. Is there any common paraphilias that hasn't been mentioned except the one we, we're going to now? Um, common? I would probably say... Um, For I would probably say a couple of the big ones might be um, voyeurism. Oh yeah, of course, yeah. exhibitionism and voyeurism. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, now to voyeurism and exhibitionism. Okay, voyeurism and exhibitionism, um, the uh, desire to be seen or the desire to um, to spy or watch other people engaging in sex, and yeah. Okay. But that's the thing. That's what I want to talk a little mm -hmm. more about. Okay. Because exhibitionism and voyeurism. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the ironic thing, people probably look at that as innocent. And I think it's very prevalent as a fetish. I, mm -hmm. And I do think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I tend to see that women tend to be more exhibitionist and men more voyeur. So maybe mm -hmm. that's a kind of gender related to. But ironically... Even though people look at this as more or less a normal fetish, ironically, it's actually for both of them are forbidden by law. Th mm -hmm. Those those would be criminal, just like pedophilia and zoophilia, although, of course, not punished as seriously. But if you go around right. exposing yourself to random people, you will yeah. be jailed. If you go yes. around a peak on other people, you will be put in jail. So mm -hmm. that's an interesting um, thing there. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh I think, you know, for people who want the freedom to um, explore being voyeurs or being exhibitionists, that's usually where you'll find um, people who may uh, engage in, say, play parties or go to certain clubs where swinging. Um, yeah, or mm. not just not even or not just even swinging, but um, certain um, fetish or uh, just adult themed clubs where you know, sex may be occurring or a sex may be allowed, of course, between consenting um, persons. And then if you're an exhibitionist, that's a great experience, you know, because you have complete strangers who may be able to gaze upon your, you know, watch you. Yeah, but nobody's paid to do it. Like it's not. No, no, nobody's paid to do yeah, it. And the yeah. same thing with the voyeurs, you know, you go and, you know, usually there is a, um, Again, because consent is such a big component uh, when it comes to um, not necessarily BDSM, but just this type of play, you know, if someone is like, hey, I don't feel comfortable with this person watching, you may have that person leave. But for the most part, it's a freedom that you get to um, actually 
indulge versus say if you're here in New York City and you're on the train and then someone is like, because this happened to me, flash it. Yeah, I read about in, in New York yeah. in the metro, people uh, go in, yeah. men, I think more, go into, mm -hmm. if it's very many people, they uh, push themselves into oh, a, yeah. a woman. Stuff that like was that. a huge thing a couple of years ago mm. um, uh, where they uh, the MTA system, that's the... Um, Metropolitan Transit Association, they had to, or Transit Authority, they had to go and actually start making concerted efforts to crack down on sexual assault on the trains. But, but, but is, that, is that a fetish? Isn't it just a creepy, desperate guy? Well, I mean, it's a, it is a fetish because there's something about the, the taboo or just the act of exposing yourself to another person. Um, hmm. Unfortunately, when it's it's funny because if he say is in say a club that's designated or or that allows voyeurism and exhibitionism he's just an exhibitionist but if he's out in public against the general public yeah. or say on a public transportation system he is the creep that's exposing himself mm. and he's probably going to get either punched in the face or kicked off the train or arrested or something to that effect you know yeah but if it's st many many people they no may not even know oh where did he go uh, you know who is it yeah. but i'm thinking that may be just helpless people who there's many people who doesn't know about these clubs or doesn't yeah uh, well yeah i mean i think um that's for me is a whole different segment of um sexual exploration because i feel like for um for kink in general there's a socioeconomic uh, component to it if yeah. you can afford it yeah then their sexual oyster is is yours you know exactly. the sexual world is your oyster rather mm. so um it's 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 interesting because that kink doesn't disappear and say those who can't afford to engage in it or just or doesn't just uh, appear in the guy who might be uh, homeless and at, on the subway or lives in the countryside far away yeah, from lives in the country. Yeah. exactly it's just like this desire to be seen and exposed because you know there's usually a shock that comes with it yeah. especially if someone if because you know it's like i said it's happened to me i've been on the train or, or been waiting on the uh for the train and it was late really late at night my mother would have killed me had she known <laughs> i've been out that late and there was a guy who was, i thought was waiting on the platform with me for a train and turns out he's I look up just in time to oh, like because wow. cause I because you know you know how you can feel someone that's like staring or watching you yeah, yeah. and I turned and like we locked eyes and I glanced down and he's masturbating in his pants like I can see him oh, like wow. you know jerking off yeah. and for him it was right around that moment that he was able to finish or orgasm and I was like for me I of course felt violated because I didn't ask to be a part of this. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you brought me into the sexual experience with you. And, uh, but then like, you know, typical New Yorker, you pick up your stuff, you go to the other end of the, the platform and you just hope he doesn't follow. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's, um, there's something about that. There's also something about the, the voyeuristic side of things, um, being able to, uh, I mean, <sighs> Most people would say it's, it's voyeurism, uh, like from a spying perspective, right? Mm. The person, the people don't know that you're watching them. And so then it becomes this clandestine act where you're doing something again, that's taboo and not allowed. And you're, um, it's a way for you also to kind of, um, participate in the sexual act without others knowing or without actually having to engage. So, um, it's it's a release it's a very it's a release all the same but just very different from say an exhibitionist or uh, or the person who's at, or the people who are actually um engaging in the sexual act so and like you said it's it's if you're in the club and you're able to afford to be in the club and do that it's a, it's allowed but if you're also the person that's standing outside on broadway and watching people through the windows having sex is a problem. So Broadway is that the uh, Hooker oh, Street? Oh no, sorry. <laughs> Broadway is a is a street that literally pretty much runs the entire length of uh, Manhattan. 
from the vision. Yeah, I know where I know where it physically is, but what does it uh, mean? Well, I'm just I'm just using that as an example as like uh, you know any person who's standing on the street what spying or other people having sex could it's problematic. But are people having sex at Broadway? Well, they might be having sex with their windows open in their apartment. Oh, like that? Oh, that's what yeah, you meant. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I meant. Okay, I thought you meant it was like a red light district. Oh, um, no, no. Oh, you didn't hear because that. Because in Amsterdam <laughs> or wherever in Europe, mm-hmm. you can go through streets and in the yeah. windows, the red light are, district. stuff yeah. is happening, right? Yeah. If, yeah. On display, I mean, deliberately. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, then that, and then that instance, you're inviting the voyeur to kind of participate. Yeah. Where, or desperate people. Yeah, or, yeah. But then for others who... You know, just this is just an invasion, the violation. And um, oh, what I was going to say is, you know, in New York City, there used to be like a, a pretty heavy, um, I guess, our own version of a red light district uh, around Times Square. But that's no more. They got rid of it. So, mm. yeah. Uh, yeah. They closed down quite a bit. America isn't exactly known for no, <laughs> being <laughs> progressive in that area. <laughs> Absolutely uh, not. Yeah, but uh, let's move on in my list. All right. Hey, are you aware of the sexologist called, what's her name? Um, oh, she's Italian. Um, her name is Esther Perel. Yes. Yes. Excellent yes. Uh, yeah. uh, yes. research there. She has the saying, love seeks closeness, mm-hmm. but desire needs space to thrive. Mm, that's such a good saying. Right? And and that's yeah. one of the things uh, in this series we're doing on relationship, gender, polarity, blah, 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 which mm-hmm. this show is a part of. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to eventually get to that problem because it's the big problem because as soon as you match with someone very mm-hmm. well on all levels you know you can't avoid love <laughs> exactly. and the more and the closer you get the the more the passion goes down and eventually it all ends right. in tears <laughs> right exactly it's the curse of man well they they say like you know um the, uh, good relationships they there's a tr- I i'm trying to think of the triangle it's like um it's basically like being like a like companionship, passion, and I can't remember the third one. Um, okay. Well, love, maybe. Uh, I think, yeah, it might be love. And at no point are all three quite in alignment. Mm. Um, and so sometimes when the passion um, res- like uh, kind of re- resides, then you have to have a foundation stronger than that. Otherwise, you're, you're almost doomed to... Um, for the relationship to end because it's hard to sustain fiery burning passion. It's just, it's just, we're just not quite built like that, you know, mm-hmm. unless like you really, really work at it. So that's why you find like when a lot of people, when the sex goes and yeah. um, if there's not a very strong foundation, like if you're not actually friends, if there's no love there, then it just kind of, Mm-hmm. fizzled out yes yeah, so. my anecdotal experience is uh, because i've been in many long distance relationships mm-hmm. um almost <laughs> only the last 10 years and I, <laughs> I i mentioned to you i was with a girl in new york too mm-hmm. and i experience in long distance relationship if you don't meet too often mm-hmm. like once a month then mm-hmm. the fire uh, can be maintained Mm -hmm. it's like and you know you maybe you know also that when people come together you you have the honeymoon phase uh, right they say three to six months where you're in love whether you're Mm -hmm. you're actually psychotic (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah but that actually basically crazy (laughs) yeah but that actually lasts longer if you i mean if you if you immediately move together it will go Mm -hmm. uh you will it will pass very quick but Mm -hmm. if you almost do not meet mm-hmm. it's prolonged it's it's ironic Absolutely. But, but it goes back to the the quote of Perel, right yeah i mean it's it's the tension that you're able to build um you know it's that um but it's, it's, it has to do with space and closeness, I think. It's something there. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So that's that. And um, that brings us over to the last uh, topic on the list mm-hmm. for part two. Okay. I, I don't even know if this is paraphilia, but I, I wrote it down. And that's uh, 
Mm-hmm. Polyamory. Is that what you call swinging? Swingers? Oh, polyamory. polyamory. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, is it a, a paraphilia? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't consider it to be one. Okay. Um, because with polyamory... Um, Could that be like a, a, like some are heterosexual, some are bisexual? Yeah, Could I that be like it, a thing like that? I, I consider it, yeah, I consider it just to be a, a more of a relationship style um, more than anything. The same way how it, it would be like considering monogamy to be a paraphilia or some type of a fetish, if you will. But, yeah, but, you know, but well, because it's it's the norm. Well, I do think yeah. some. I think some people are really born, uh, oh, like e- either monogamous or uh, poly- oh, yeah. polyamorous. Well, I think I think again, it's there's a bit of nature versus nurture. You know, you're taught that you know. Not only are you taught that monogamy is like the standard, like you know, it's what you do, but it's, you know, we then also kind of. Um, put it on even more of a celestial plane with like the idea of soulmates and one perfect person yeah. for another person. That's the opposite. Yeah. Which is, I, I don't agree with that. Um, I, I like the idea of soulmates plural. Yeah. Um, you're saying, you're saying not one no. among six billion, but, that, yeah. but you acknowledge one can achieve such a relationship, obviously. Oh, right? yeah. yeah mm. I think so. Absolutely. Mm. Um, but you know, the same, th- I feel like, uh, with polyamory, it's, I think one of the reasons why it's catching on more and more, or at least it's getting more, um, mainstream, uh, exposure is because m- more and more people are starting to question the whole notion of this idea of, you know, being traditional connected yeah, yeah, mm. to one person for their entire lives. Um, it's, I think it was... It's- yeah, but look, here in Scandinavia, we are very mm-hmm. liberal when it comes to sex. You probably know that, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, it's c- completely common. And, and that's also why I'm having this show. I, I haven't seen any podcasts, uh, well, a few only taking up these things. So I thought, okay, mm-hmm. let's let's do it. <laughs> but, Absolutely. But here's the thing. It's totally common now among young people to have had a lot of sex partners, but it mm-hmm. doesn't hurt. It doesn't even hurt the marriage numbers. No. In fact, I think marriages are going up. So at some point they settle. Mm-hmm. So think, serial, serial monogamy. So I, I'm not sure it's related to having access to one or many partners. I, I think it's deeper. I think it's like be bisexuality, homosexuality. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, but I think it's also just because, you know, there's um, uh, there's actually a really great book about polyamory. It's by this uh, woman called her name. She goes with a name, Grace, uh, Gracie X. Mm-hmm. And she talks about how she and her husband decided to first open their marriage um, to having other partners because they, mind you, they, they very much loved each other. They were mm. still very much in love with each other, but there was, it wasn't so much that something else was missing, but it was just more so about wanting to explore and add to the love they they had Mm. and so they actually found themselves um having separate uh romantic relationships long-term relationships with uh uh, one other partner and then romantic or sexual uh it was both it was both wow yeah then it's then it's really polyamory and not polysexuality yeah Yeah. Mm. exactly and so they um ultimately decided to all come together and uh have a polyamorous (laughs) existence Uh, all Um, four (laughs) well no 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 so um the the two partners i think the married couple they still stayed partnered while they brought in their other um, partner into the like, so everyone basically was living all together under one roof, but wow. the the two extraneous or the the um, secondary partners they did not engage with one another. Ah, right. And I, I think one of the reasons why the the book was so interesting was because um, they also had children, mm. and so uh, she kind of talks about not only the idea of trying to blend a family, but some of the um, the barriers and 
and roadblocks that they kind of encountered along the way, even from a legal perspective. Yeah, yeah, it must be many socially. Yeah, and, uh, yes. everything. Yeah, but but it's so. interesting. Could you distinguish between those who want to stay in just one romantic? partnership but then they can have sex uh, on the side mm -hmm. and people who do like this where they actually can love several people at the same time is that distinguishable or oh absolutely okay. absolutely there you know it's it's, it's uh there's so many different styles of relationships under the the poly umbrella um okay and you know there may be some where you know one part even how harems is that part of it uh no her <laughs> one person living with three or four of of the other I mean, gender. It 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 can be, but I think that every man's dream. Exactly. <laughs> 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 oh, maybe I am polyamorous after all. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. You knew it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, you know, it's uh, you know, there's somewhere it's it's strictly sex. Um, you know, it's just a kind of a, a pick from column A, column B situ situation. Like I love my primary partner. This is the person who I want to spend my life with. But, mm. you know, I also like to engage in sex with other people because, you know, I feel like, I feel like all interactions, every time that we meet another person, no matter how um, minute the, the interaction, the, it changes us in some way, whether it's the person yeah. who bags your groceries or the person who you decide to share your life with for like 20, 30 plus years. Mm -hmm. And I feel like sex is the same way. I feel like it's a, right. it's a coupling thing of you coming together and you exchange a part of yourself with that person and you walk and you leave different than how you entered it. Um, now, however much, uh, uh, however much weight you actually put into that exchange, that 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 event with this other person, that's totally subjective. Um, mm. You know, because that's why so many people might be able to engage with multiple, multiple, multiple partners and feel they'll say that they feel nothing, but they're. I think on some uh, microscopic level, there is um, there's a full relationship that happens you know, when mm. you engage in sex with another person. Yeah, everybody has had a mistress or, or, or a lover or whatever you call it. Just a sexual relationship knows the classical problem, right? Yeah. Sooner or later, one of them wants more. Yeah, especially if you... I mean, I I am always... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm always reluctant when I meet people who say that they have had long-term sexual relationships with other people and they still feel nothing beyond the sex like like, like there's no emotional connection there and I just you know because I think that at some point I mean unless you are you just you are completely devoid of feeling period yeah autist yeah yeah, I feel like there's going to be some moment where a twinge happens. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You get that that inkling that there may be something deeper there. And it's it's hard enough to find one person like that, but then to find two people yeah. who are on that page so for a sustainable amount of time, that's almost impossible. And so to your you know, I I'll even take it a little bit further. I think um long-term relationships, no matter how platonic their friendship or the relationship may be, there may come a moment where at some point, even if you don't voice it, you're going to question, should we or shouldn't we? Mm. So, and I, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but I think... Um, no, it's completely natural and unavoidable. Yeah, yeah it's natural. It's absolutely natural. And you can't avoid it. Nobody is <laughs> ecstatically happy all the no. time. It's absolutely. challenges. But, I don't but, trust a person who says they're happy all the time. No, I agree. Yeah. No, but I, I think I actually did manage a successful uh, relationship like that once. Mm -hmm. uh, only once uh, mm -hmm. it was successful and we even parted as friends. But here's the thing. Of course I felt something. I, I, we said to each other... The, the difference between this and a traditional monogamous relationship where you're like, you know, I, I think if you have a boyfriend-girlfriend thing, mm -hmm. then uh, the, the only difference is this. If 
you can imagine growing old together. If you can't imagine growing old together, it's not a boyfriend girlfriend thing. Mm-hmm. That you have to, I'm not saying you, you think it's going to happen, but you have, have to be able to imagine mm-hmm. it. If you can imagine it, then mm-hmm. it's healthy. The other thing is, if my girlfriend calls me in the middle of the night, I better pick up the phone. Okay. <laughs> she has that right or that, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. because, you know, it can be anything. But if in the other relationship, the more practical, convenient sexual relationship, you don't have to do that. You don't have mm-hmm. to pick up. It's probably a booty call anyway. <laughs> so uh, that's the two differences as I see it. But right. not having feelings, I think you have to be very mature to handle such a relationship. I mean, mm-hmm. what we did yeah, we met uh, every weekend or every second weekend, but we didn't just engage in intercourse. We watched mm. a movie, we ate pizza, mm-hmm. we went for a walk, we, we mm. talked about stuff. You had a relationship. We had a relationship, yeah. right? It right. was just we removed that component that we're going to get married and have children and all that stuff. Right. Right. And, and so I think that's how that can be successful. But you also have to be able to remo- uh, you know, know that... You do, you can't want that it's going to be deeper because then you can't part when the time comes to part. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, when some, like taking it back to polyamory, yeah. um, when some couples decide that they may want to open up uh, their relationship, they'll try and have, uh, you know, these, I guess, like a contract from the beginning where they make up rules about the relationship or, and then they'll might, they may even try and make the relationship, um, they'll try and uh, formulate it as a hierarchy, right? So this is my primary partner and therefore they get certain privileges that the, the, the new partner may never be able to receive. Mm -hmm. Um, such as one of those privileges might be if I say that I need you, and I call you middle of the night, you're required to come and attend to my needs, et cetera. Mm-hmm. While the, the, the new... Yeah, but if you love someone, you, you want to, you know, what's right. up, right? Right. And so, and that's why, um, for me, the idea of a hierarchy with uh, polyamory can be a bit problematic because it, it's hard. First of all, I feel like it's really hard to tell yourself that the relationship will only be one thing. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, just because like I said, you know, it is a relationship and things may happen. Things may transpire. um, Feelings may come into play. Deeper bonds may be um, strengthened or made. Um, And also, I also don't like the idea of um, relegating your, the new partner to such, um, restrictions because it puts them in a, in a space where there's the limitation to the relationship may be detrimental to them in the long run, Mm. because you may want to increase that, that, uh, that bond, or you may want to take the relationship to the next level. And if the person, um, is automatically, um, putting these boundaries there, uh, it unless you're able, I, I like the idea of being able to have these a, a boundary rather than a rule mm-hmm. because um, you know with with a with a boundary it may be it's movable it uh, you can expand that relationship at some point um, rather than trying to keep it boxed in um, you know that's why uh, you you've heard of people who. Uh, Couples when they search for unicorns. What? Uh, what? You, What's that? A uni- oh, so um, unicorns. Unicorns are people who co- may come into a coupled relationship as the third person. Oh. Uh, yeah. And, <laughs> and, and want nothing more than just, you know, that, that instance. And it's problematic because it's kind of like, this person is not really a person then. It's merely a means for you to... Um, it's an advanced sex toy. Yeah, yeah. It's a sex toy that... That the, that the couple use. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, and usually it's also, it's also like, oh, uh, it's, or, or what, I, what I call um, 
it's uh, especially like when men are seeking, say, a third par- partner, another partner for their for their um, for sex. Mm-hmm. But it's always just a woman who likes other women, you know, yeah. or rather they're they're they'll be OK with opening up the relationship as long as it's only a woman. Yeah, but but uh, I mean, that's that goes to, you know, uh, to not to speak for all men, but I think. Let's be honest. It's we don't we don't want competition. We don't we feel threatened. I mean, right? I, I get it. I we understand. don't want her to enjoy him more than us, especially not if we're <laughs> if I'm in a relationship with a girl, and we get in a th- another man, and she enjoys that more. For a swinger, that uh, <laughs> doesn't seem to be a problem. But for a monogamous right. person, especially if you're not very secure in your sexuality, that's a big deal. But see, that for me then is just. Uh, <sighs> It's it's a it's a problem because if your partner if she desires another a third person, you're automatically taking away that option for her, right? Well, yeah. As soon as she engaged in a relationship, yes. uh, in a monogamous relationship, obviously, yeah, <laughs> that's a natural well, boundary. But see, but see, but that's just it, though. Like, if she, let's say, if you have a woman who may allow you to open up and bring in this third person uh-huh. you know she may you're you're you i have to pay her back or, well, <laughs> i mean it's only right <laughs> also, i mean it's like this idea of like well she may not be bisexual but she's doing this for you the thing right. is i think i think when people think uh especially when it comes to like male female male uh threesomes or cup or um uh dynamics like that that i expect both men to also engage in sex. And that may not be it at all. Because no. the same way how some women will agree to bring in another woman into the dynamic, but only for the pleasure of, say, the male partner, then that's totally fine. But, yeah, but look, look you you're know, forgetting. Sorry, go on. No. So, but for me, like, if I decide that I do want to, perhaps I want to be the, sandwich, the, the meat in the sandwich, you know? Sure. Perhaps I want to have two men who lavish mm. themselves upon me, I feel like we have to kind of get beyond this idea of <sighs> that I'm not saying that I'm not saying that that the that the male partner may be consciously trying to subjugate and control his partner's sexuality, but in a way he is. Well I, I think he's trying to control the relationship. But but here's the thing, you forget uh, it seems, and that's that there's gender differences. First off, more mm. females than men are bisexual. That's just a fact. Why is another debate? We don't have to take that now. That's one. But the second is I think and this I can't say as sure, but I think that it's easier uh, i think a man is uh, how should i put this uh, we we don't judge women by the performance in bed some of us probably do but uh, not to be crude but strictly speaking it's it's a whole right <laughs> <laughs> it is but the, we have the opposite and so there will be differences uh-huh. in how a woman experiences it, it, sure it's other things than just a physical thing too but you know i think size matters to a certain degree it does it's not not the only thing that matters but if you have a woman with a let's say a, a big vagina and a man with a small penis but not too small and too big that they can't enjoy each other. But then comes a man with a bigger penis that matches her vagina better. Then I don't blame her for feeling better there. If There's other components too, but let's say just those components will skew the balance. Opposite wouldn't happen because the vagina adapts, as you know. And so maybe one will feel a little tighter or whatever, but you know, that's... It's not a big deal. It's just the same kind of gender difference as many females are attracted to to men's... What position we have matters. If I'm an unemployed person, it's not that attractive of a component as if I'm having a career I'm thriving in and loving. Reverse it. We don't give a damn what your occupation is. If you're pretty and kind and all those things. So there are certain gender differences that we don't even have to discuss if it's biological or if it's nurture. I'm just saying they're there. And that explains why, but, why I think. But see, I think, I, I think that though 
is so heavily based in gender and nurturing. Um, mm-hmm. I feel that. So there's a, a matter of fact, I think I, I want to send you this article that I uh, had for one of my, my classes where it, uh, it was, it was uh, looking at the, uh, the gender as a box or several different boxes. And, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the idea of, um, acceptable bisexuality when it comes to women. Um, that is something that goes along with the, uh, feminine gender in the sense that women are encouraged to be more quote unquote emotional and open. And, you know, the idea of having a close female confidant or friend is not something that we look down upon. Like we actually, we encourage that while men it's, uh, more taboo men, obviously yeah, yeah it's very taboo and which is again if you look back say even like 150 years the way that men interacted with one another was completely different um, and in some cultures today still yeah, and, yeah exactly um you know matter of fact i so i happen to be a, a really weird historian nerd when it comes to abraham lincoln oh, wow. i'm obsessed with him <laughs> yeah okay i'm obsessed okay. and so you know, um, one of his close friends, I think, I think his name is uh, John Spade. Um, he was one of his close companions for for many many years. And they, uh, there's a book I had that uh, kind of looks at the correspondence he had with this with this individual. And you know, they talk about their times of closeness and uh, the connection mm. that they felt with one another, and sleeping uh, in the same bed and sharing a room for years and. Wow. The idea of that would be completely unheard of uh, today. Yeah, well, he wasn't just a closet homosexual. Yeah, so, so, so there is, you know, there. That's one of the things that people have kind of um, uh, uh, questioned about Abraham Lincoln, whether mm-hmm. uh, with regards to his sexuality. But the idea of men like sharing a bed was not unheard of at all during those times, mm. and so it just kind of goes to show that. That didn't just stop being a thing suddenly. That's something that we then decided was inappropriate for men. And therefore, we started to kind of sh- change the way that we reared male children, you know, and yeah. then we yeah. started to change what we consider to be normal relationships for adult men. It's not so much sharing your deepest, darkest fears and secrets and hugging one of, uh, one another um, as a moment of closeness, but it's beer and wings and football and, you know, <laughs> all these things, you know. Not, and, not here. But, yeah, but you know what I mean. Yeah. In ancient Greece, it was a concept to have, I forgot the word for it, but mm-hmm. young boys, right. not talking, not talking pre pubertal but Still, young right. boys was a thing. Mm-hmm. A married man, it was like if you had made it in life, you would entertain like a young yeah. lover, uh, yeah. one of the slaves and, or whatever. And, 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 and you still had a wife. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And you still made children and all that yeah. stuff. So, yeah, I know it's a thing. Yeah. But, but and I know and that same thing actually was, uh, was, was in Roman times. Many uh, in ancient Rome, men actually did not believe that they could share a deep emotional connection with a woman, that they were incapable of doing so. Women were strictly there for to birth and raise children or, you know, for the young that they sired. But the action, but the, they felt that women didn't actually have the mental capacity or the emotional capacity to share that type of love. So military culture. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So like with the idea of men being um, threatened by the idea of another penis being in the room, and I'm not saying that that's not rooted in um, biological foundations like from eons ago. We, because girls doesn't have pissing contests, but men do. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but we also look at you. But maybe it's cultural. I, I, I don't care why. I'm just saying that's a component here. Yeah, absolutely. But I think that, you know, the same way how we're trying to shift the idea of what um, normal sexuality looks like, I think that's another discussion mm. that needs to be had as well. Yeah, yeah. If only just because, like, I. I want I my my goal with my the, the the goal of my future practice is for everyone to be their best sexual self. Mm. And 
and I, and I want, and also for, you know, whatever partners you may have for them to want you to be your best sexual self as, as well. And so if it's a question of wondering if this other penis in the room may be better than you are, and then wondering what that does for your relationship, I see what you mean. that's not about the sex. That's about something. Else. It's about yourself. It's not about your yeah, partner. It's something yeah, that yeah. may be amiss in your relationship, you know? Mm. So I feel like, for me, sex sometimes can be the canary in the coal mine when it comes to relationships. <laughs> so if there's an issue there, usually it means there's something else right, deeper. Right. And so a penis, a, a two, three, six more penises in the room shouldn't be the issue. I see what you mean. Okay, before I, I just have to, to whitewash myself here. Uh, <laughs> the reason I was trying to... Uh, make a case for those of us who will not entertain a third man is not because I feel threatened, mm-hmm. I have to say that. <laughs> it's because I'm completely heterosexual, that's why. Mm-hmm. And, and I haven't, I've met, I'd say 20% of my female partners have been just as heterosexual as myself. Mm-hmm. But 80%, I, I'm not saying they lived it out or anything uh, mm-hmm. in our relationship, but 80% were mm-hmm. to some degree uh, mm-hmm. bisexual. And if that's the case, if the woman is yeah. 100% hetero, if there's such a thing as 100%, yeah. but if she's so much hetero that she couldn't have sex with another woman and a man is a little more by then yeah. i think it's then i think it's but okay I think, I, in fact i know a relationship where that happened where they had a man mm-hmm. as a playing partner mm-hmm. because he was bisexual she was not but look so, at the type of porn that we have though like yeah. think of it this way because like bisexuality in women is so much more culturally and socially acceptable yeah, yeah. because even if you're looking at it from say a, a porn perspective it's through the male gaze and as we said earlier men the idea of having not just one woman but two women willing to sex to have sleep uh, to sleep with you have sex with you who would want to turn that down and <laughs> so there's a there might be a reason why even like um if you do happen to come across male female male uh pornography it's not even so much at the woman's pleasure no she's still just like an entity for them to use it's more like a gang rape exactly and so i think if we I don't think it's so much more that women are more so bisexual. I think we just have more cart. We have more allowance to explore that side of ourselves simply because the gaze allows it. The male gaze mm. allows for that to happen. Because even then, if you think about like the type of uh, male, female. Well, uh, adolescent girls who, who make out. Yeah. But I mean, like, you know, it was like just like a female, male, female porn. You know, you're also going to see a certain type of woman who's going to be engaged in that it's not going to be two women that you find unattractive who you're going to do that with so you know i think it's just about changing or not even changing the gaze but allowing for more perspectives for more voices okay for uh more lenses of what sex should look like and maybe who knows in the next generation it might shift maybe and then suddenly two men Woman. If it's culturally dependent, yes. Yeah, if it's culturally dependent, yeah. Yeah, but but uh, I'm yielding now just because we have to take a break <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and because we're drifting Absolutely. off we're drifting off topic. We're discussing courses now, <laughs> causations, <laughs> and that's not really uh, uh, yeah. room, room for today. It's a very interesting uh, debate, though. Yeah. Uh, we should have a show on that. Sure. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's going to be awesome. Yeah, that would be great. That would be great. It's going to be awesome. Yes. Okay. um, Let's um, take a break. Sure, sure. So see you in a couple of minutes in part three. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Okay. 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 All of our files are free and will remain free. If you like the show, you can show support by donating $1 to help with expenses. Just use the PayPal link on our website, YouTube channel, or Facebook page. Thanks. Thanks. 